I'm going to work through an example problem now that is um, a type of measurement device that's for measuring the viscosity. So, that, so any device that does that is called a viscometer. Um, and I'm going, to wrote, I'm going to run through an example of how a rotating viscometer works, or at least one type of rotating viscometer. So here's the device, and this is generically how it works. Um, you have a inside cylinder made of like a solid piece of something, like maybe aluminum, and you have an outside piece um, that in this case is, is kind of like a bucket that rotates around that's filled with fluid. So what you do is you rotate this bucket that's on the outside by a known, um, let's say, angular rotation rate that I'll call capital omega. And um, when you rotate it, if the inner cylinder is stationary, then what will happen is there's a difference in the velocity of those two surfaces. And when you put a fluid in between, that creates a shear stress. Um, that shear stress is going to impart a force on the outside of this inner cylinder and that's going to try and torque it. Um, and so what you do is you put a rod or some sort of other suspension um, up above that inner piece and uh, that rod, if, if everything's held stationary, has some torque on it and it will twist a little bit and you can actually measure how much it twists and use that as a way to measure the torque on the device. So. Um, the objective of this uh, example problem is to figure out what the relationship is between how fast I rotate the device and how much torque I measure. Um, and in particular, like, how do I back out the viscosity if I run this experiment? Um, so uh, I'm going to call the outer di or the inner diet or the inner radius of that cylinder. I'm going to call R sub I, and the outer radius I'm going to call R sub zero. Um, just for notational purposes, I'll call the velocity that's um, in the direction of the you know rotation. I'll call that u sub theta, so uh, the theta component of the velocity um, of the fluid that sits in between. Um, because the outside cylinder is moving and the inside cylinder is stationary there'll be a velocity gradient, right? So um, according to our no-slip condition, the velocity of the fluid that touches the outer cylinder will be the same velocity as the bucket. So that would be the radius r0 times the angular velocity omega. So r times omega is the velocity of the outer wall, and ri times omega um, oh, sorry, sorry, no, that's incorrect. The inner wall is stationary, so its velocity is zero. And then um, if, it, if the gap in between is thin, then the velocity profile will be sort of a linear interpolation in between. Um, so it'll go from zero at the inner wall to r zero times omega at the outer wall. All right, so with that being said, let's calculate the relationship between the torque and omega. So um, the torque in general is related to the distribution of shear stress on the outside of the inner cylinder. Um, so it's related by an integral over the entire area of that inner cylinder um, times uh, a moment arm, Ri, times um, all the little elements of force acting on the outside of the cylinder. So I've tried to sketch those there here. So imagine that this is a um, element of area, and because it's got a shear stress acting on it, there's a force associated with that. We need to sum over all those little elements. So the, each element of force is a shear stress times the area. Um, but in cylindrical coordinates, we can actually write the little elements of area as Ri d theta times the vertical height. Um, in this case, the vertical height, I'll actually just write a, rather than doing the summation over maybe the entire thing, what I'll do is I'll relabel these as um, little elements that go all the way from the top to the bottom. So in that case, that would be, let's call that h, maybe is the 
vertical height. Um, for the moment, actually, uh, a keen observer will note that there's actually a bottom to this thing, too. Maybe we can come back and talk about that bottom. Um, it, it turns out that calculating the relationship between torque and frequency on the bottom is actually a little bit harder, but um, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, okay, so we want to be able to do this integral, so we need to evaluate the shear stress as well. So that shear stress is related to the viscosity as mu times how quickly the velocity changes over the distance that is relevant. So in that case, that's this is r. So the velocity is ch the u u theta velocity is changing in the r direction, and in this case, how quickly it's changing is actually mu times uh, what is that uh, r zero, um, actually, why don't I, I'm gonna rewrite this down here so I have a little bit more space. So uh, du theta dr represents how quickly the velocity is changing um, at, with respect to space as I move. Um, note that the, the velocity always changes in a direction that's orthogonal to the spatial direction, right? So u theta is orthogonal to changes in r. All right, if I have a linear velocity profile, which I will if I have a small gap anyway, then this is given by the difference between um, the velocity on the outer wall, which is r zero, um, times omega minus the velocity at the inner wall, which is ri time, or sorry, is just zero. So this is zero at the inner wall divided by the change in radius, which is r zero minus ri. So that's basically the approximation of this slope. And in fact, that's actually an exact value if the velocity profile is linear, like I've been sort of indicating that it is. So in that case, um, we can, actually you can take a look at this integral, inside this integral, so this is an integral that's fundamentally over theta at this point, but actually none of the stuff inside actually depends on theta. Um, so the shear stress in particular is only a function of, um, no, it's, it's not a, it's not a function of theta. So, um, this integral over theta can, everything can be done outside the integral, it turns out. And so the torque is R I squared, if I combine the two R I's times R zero times lambda or times theta times, or sorry, that's omega times h divided by the gap size times mu times, uh, so if I'm doing the integral over the theta, that gives me an extra factor of two pi. Let me shift some things over here. So that's our relationship between the torque that you would measure on the, I guess I'll call it a torque meter. Um, that's the relationship between the torque you would measure and the, freq the angular frequency of rotation. And note that the constant of proportionality that's between those two things um, is related to mu as well as the geometry that's in between. So you can back out mu if you knew, know that. Um, now, usually the, the torque that's due to the bottom portion is less significant basically because if you think about it, this inner portion actually spins a lot slower than the outer portion. So that if I'm thinking about the stuff that's underneath the cylinder, um, the torque that you're going to get is generally going to be smaller than um, what you get on the sidewalls, but we can do that calculation as well. Um, so, I mean, you can imagine that you know, if I, if I were to really zoom in on what's happening there, I have another disk, uh, 
that is, okay, so there's stuff up here. This disk is spinning and this one is stationary. And there's some velocity profile that exists in between, but it's both a function of r and, let's see, I don't know what to call this distance, but if there's a bottom here, if this is, uh, I don't know, let's call it t, um, if there's some distance here, then the velocity profile would locally look something like this, but near the inside, uh, boy, this gets kind of hard to draw, but as you go in, the velocity is smaller. And basically at some point there, you know, it basically doesn't exist because the velocity at the wall, so u theta at the outside is r times omega um, and so if I were to calculate, you know, how much shear stress is on an element right here, that shear stress in this case is du theta dy, so if y is, let's say, this direction, times mu, um, which is mu r theta over t if t is the distance between those two things. Um, so I could go back and do the same calculation. So I'm actually just going to steal. Nothing actually changes. I, I'll just steal this equation. Oh, actually, some things do change here. I need to be a little bit careful. No, I actually, I need to actually rewrite it. So I'm looking to calculate the torque due to, say, this element up here. So that would be um, r times df. Yeah, so um, you can relate that to the shear stress as tau dA. And then dA itself is actually r dr d theta. Um, again, there's no angular dependence, so you can actually immediately integrate over, um, so that's from 0 to ri and from 0 to 2 pi, uh, if I reverse the order here. Um, there's no dependence on theta, so you can actually integrate that right away. So that's actually 2 pi times r squared tau dr from 0 to ri. But then we've already shown that um, oops, tau itself depends on r as well. I can kind of see right away that I'm going to end up with something that has, so this has an r and this has two, this has r squared. So I'm going to need to integrate r cubed, which is r to the fourth. Um, over 4. So this is going to turn out to be ri to the 4th over 4 times mu omega divided by t. Um, let's make sure that I got all the factors here. So I got the two r's. Yeah, I think I got it all. Um, we can check units here. So um, we, we should end up with something that has units of torque. Um, so this thing here is newtons per meter squared second. That's viscosity. This thing is per second. Radians per second. Um, this thing's meters. This thing's also, this thing will be meters to the fourth. And so if I check it out, I better get Newton meters. Let's check. Um, so one of these meters, so this meter cancels with one of these. So that gives me a, a three. And then there's two down here. So that leaves me with one behind. So 
the final units would have units in meters. Clearly the newtons don't cancel. Let's check our seconds. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I wrote this as meters. I, I wrote that as the, in the denominator, but this should actually be in the numerator. So, um, so this seconds cancels with the per seconds and we get the right units. So at least in terms of dimensional consistency, that seems right. Right, so, so this is our final result here. Boop, 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 boop. Um, so generally, as long as the, um, the height is sufficiently big um, and, the, um, and the, the, the gap T is you know, sufficiently big, the bottom portion of the viscosity of the viscometer won't matter all that much. But you can actually calculate what it is in this way. Uh, okay, so you can kind of see that this actually becomes mostly an exercise in calculus. Um, the primary, probably the primary difficulty in doing this sort of problem and, and analyzing viscometers is trying to be able to calculate what the velocity profile is. So just basically the insight that at the bottom wall, the um, velocity is r omega and that there's a linear profile in between that and the outer wall. That's actually the, the key thing that's required is the ability to calculate the shear stress by calculating how quickly the velocity changes with space. All right. 